Good day everybody. This is Dr. Sanjay Sanyal, Professor Department Chair. I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of the components of the pectoral girdle, the clinical functional correlations and some clinical applications. I'm holding up the right clavicle for you. And you can see this is the sternal end of the clavicle. This is the medial two thirds of the clavicle, which is curved anteriorly. And this is the acromial end of the clavicle. And we can see that the lateral one third of the clavicle is curved posteriorly. So this is the right side. So this is the one which forms the sternoclavicular joint. And this is the one which forms the acromioclavicular joint. We don't have the sternum, but I will show you the acromioclavicular joint. So I'm holding up the scapula here. And you can see that this is the acromion process. And the acromion process then continues as the spine of the scapula. So you can see that this is the smooth portion here. This smooth portion is the one which forms the acromioclavicular joint and it articulates with this smooth portion of the clavicle. So therefore, this is the acromioclavicular joint. Both of them are sliding joints, the sternoclavicular and the acromioclavicular. They are enclosed in a fibrous capsule and they're synovial joints and there's an intra-articular disc of fibrocartilage which partially or completely separates the joint and both of them are uniaxial joints. The sternoclavicular joint is reinforced by several sets of ligaments. We have an anterior sternoclavicular ligament, a posterior sternoclavicular ligament, we have the interclavicular ligament and the costoclavicular ligament attaching to the first rib. So therefore, the sternoclavicular joint is very strong, very stable. And during dissection, we have a lot of difficulty trying to disarticulate the sternoclavicular joint. And in clinical practice also, the sternoclavicular joint hardly ever dislocates. Acromioclavicular joint, on the other hand, is, not, is also reinforced by many ligaments, but it is more likely to either dislocate or separate, but that will come to a little later. The ligaments attached to this, one is the ligament itself, connecting the clavicle to the acromion process. That is called the acromioclavicular ligament. Then we have some supporting ligaments. One of them is the coracoclavicular ligament, which extends from the coracoid process to the clavicle. This has got two components, a medial component, which is called the conoid part, which is attached to the conoid tubercle and a lateral component called the trapezoid part, which is attached to the trapezoid line on the clavicle. And then we have a coracoacromial arch, which extends from the coracoid process to the acromion process. With these two are extrinsic ligaments, which indirectly support the acromioclavicular joint. Therefore, the true ligament of the acromioclavicular joint is the acromioclavicular ligament itself. Now let's take a look at the amount of excursions that are possible. As I said, both the joints are sliding joints. They are uniaxial joints. When my arm is in the neutral position. So that is the position when this clavicle is like this. When I flex my shoulder, the lateral end of the clavicle moves forward by 30 degrees. It slides. So therefore, at that position, there is sliding movement at the sternoclavicular joint and at the same time, there's sliding movement at the acromioclavicular joint also. When I push my arm back, extend it, the lateral end of the clavicle moves back by another 30 degrees. So therefore, the total excursion is 30 degrees forward, 30 degrees backwards. From the neutral position, when I do overhead abduction, then again, the same sliding movement occurs here and the lateral end of the clavicle moves up by 60 degrees and comes back to the neutral position. So therefore, the total excursion in this axis is 60 degrees and the total excursion in this axis is also 60 degrees, 30 plus 30. And all of them are sliding. Now let's take a look at the scapula itself. The scapula, as you know, is on the surface of the chest wall and in between we have the serratus anterior muscle here and subscapularis. This forms what is known as a functional scapulothoracic articulation. It is not a true joint. The scapula can rotate on the chest wall. It can move forward during protraction. It can move back during retraction of the shoulder. When we are doing overhead abduction, the glenoid can rotate up and down. This is referred to as a scapulohumeral rhythm and it is a fixed ratio of one is to two. That means for a full 180 degrees of abduction, 60 degrees is constituted by the rotation of the scapula and 120 degrees is contributed by the movement of the humerus. So this is what is meant by scapulohumeral rhythm. One is to two. 60 degrees of this plus 120 degrees of this contribute to the total 180 degrees of overhead abduction. At this juncture, I will remind you that the humerus and the glenoid fossa this is the true shoulder joint. This is not part of the pectoral girdle. However, every movement of the shoulder joint is accompanied by movements of the pectoral girdle. The actual pectoral girdle bones are the clavicle and the scapula. And the actual joints are the sternoclavicular joint and the acromioclavicular joint. Now let's take a look at 
some clinical correlations pertaining to these joints. As I mentioned, the sternoclavicular joint is very stable. It does not dislocate in clinical practice so easily. And if it has to dislocate, there'll be much more serious injuries to the chest and the neck. In contrast, we can have separation of the acromioclavicular joint. If a person falls on his elbow, then he can have tear of the acromioclavicular ligament, but the coracoclavicular ligament will be intact. And therefore, there will be separation of the acromioclavicular joint. And you can see this in the accompanying radiological image, which I'm going to put in this video. This is an X-ray of the chest on the right side showing acromioclavicular joint separation. On the other hand, if a person falls on his shoulder, then he can have a more serious injury and that is acromioclavicular joint dislocation as opposed to separation. And in clinical terms, it is often quite erroneously referred to as shoulder separation, but it is actually strictly speaking, not shoulder separation, but it's a complete dislocation of the acromioclavicular joint. And what happens in this acromioclavicular ligament as usual is torn. Additionally, the coracoclavicular ligament, which I said has got two components, the conoid and the trapezoid part, they are also torn. And therefore, the lateral end of the clavicle moves up and it forms a distinct bulge on the tip of the shoulder, of course, accompanied by severe pain. This is acromioclavicular joint dislocation. This is another X-ray of the chest shoulder joint to show acromioclavicular dislocation. Now let's take a look at some fractures of the clavicle. The most common type of fracture is at the junction of the medial two thirds, which I said is curved anteriorly and the lateral one third, which I said is curved posteriorly. The most common fracture is at the junction of this. And this usually occurs when a person falls on his outstretched hand. And this occurs when a person is suffering from osteoporosis or it can happen in children. Because of the indirect blow transmitted from the hand to the shoulder, to the clavicle, the fracture occurs here. So therefore this is an indirect blow. There's no direct blow to the clavicle. When this fracture occurs, then what happens, the distal portion of the clavicle, it sags down with the weight of the arm. And the proximal portion of the clavicle moves up by the pull of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is usually occurs in all types of fractures of the clavicle. And you can see that in the accompanying X-ray. We can get yet much less common, but we can get, if there's a direct blow to the clavicle, then we can get a fracture somewhere in the middle of the clavicle. And then also the distal portion of the clavicle, the lateral portion sags down because of the weight of the arm and the proximal portion moves up by the pull of the sternocleidomastoid muscle which is attached here. This is the plain X-ray of the left side of the chest to show fracture of the clavicle showing upward elevation of the proximal fragment. That brings me to an important point. What are the secondary injuries which are possible when there's a fracture of the clavicle? If you remember that the clavicle forms one of the boundaries of the cervical axillary canal, other boundaries being formed by the first rib and the scapula, upper border of the scapula. And through the cervical axillary canal passes the brachial plexus the divisions of the brachial plexus, which continue to the axilla, and of course the axillary artery and the axillary vein. When there is a fracture of the clavicle, then it can injure the lower trunk of the brachial plexus, more specifically the branch, the fibers which contribute to the ulnar nerve. So therefore, ulnar nerve injury is a possibility in a fracture of the clavicle. And that will produce radial claw hand and loss of sensation on the medial side of the hand. Another secondary injury that can happen is injury to the suprascapular nerve. Because the suprascapular nerve runs like this across the suprascapular notch, supplies the supraspinatus in the supraspinous fossa, and then it goes around and then supplies the infraspinous muscle in the infraspinatus fossa. And the clavicle is located right here. So therefore, fracture of the clavicle can injure the suprascapular nerve, which will produce paralysis of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle, which are the rotator cuff muscles. So therefore, the person will have difficulty in initiating abduction, which is the action of the supraspinatus. Running on the skin, cutaneous on the surface of the clavicle, we have a series of nerves. They are referred to as the supraclavicular nerves. And usually there are three branches, a medial, intermediate, and lateral. They usually run like this in front. They are a branch of the cervical plexus. Rarely they can go through the clavicle itself. They run under the platysma and then they pierce the platysma and supply the skin in this region. In a fracture of the clavicle, one or more branches of the supraclavicular nerve can also be injured with loss of sensation in the appropriate region of the front of the upper chest or the front of the shoulder. So these are the three associated injuries, secondary injuries that you can get in a fracture of the clavicle. So these are some of the points which I want to mention to you about the sternoclavicular acromioclavicular joint, the clinical correlations, their functional implications and some aspects of the fracture of the clavicle. Thank you very much for watching. Dr. Sanjay Sanya signing out. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day.